Well, hello there. My name is Doug Frost, and I just want to give you a little background on uh, Patagonia and then the article that I wrote about Patagonia for uh, Grand Mark and, uh, you know, give you some maps, if nothing else, so we can kind of put this in perspective. So if you all allow me to, I'll do the little PowerPoint thing. You know, I know we're all pretty fond of the whole PowerPoint thing, but bear with me. Um, you may know that this is South America. I hope you do. You may know that Argentina and Chile are both there. I hope you do. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to focus in on, on uh, Patagonia. But, but first, you know, let's just understand a bit more about these countries. I, I tried to provide some background in the article, um, a little bit of historical background, a little bit of the cultural background, because they're very different. They're, they're separated by the Andes for sure, but they're separated by other cultural differences. And, and so I've tried to lay that out a little bit, but in, in either case, when we're talking about Patagonia, we are talking about both countries sharing the southern part of South America, uh, darn close to Antarctica when you get right down to the end of it. Areas that have been remote for a lot of reasons, cultural, geographic, um, military, even uh, certainly in the case of, of Chile, um, just difficult to get to and, and difficult as well to have wide scale um, agriculture, certainly wide scale viticulture, even though both of these um, areas, you know, both Patagonias, as it were, both Chile and, and Argentine, um, do have wine going back 100 years or more, but not much. So it's, it's very much a, a product of what's happening with climate change, um, what's happening with a, a cultural shift in both countries away from um, the wines that they traditionally made. In the case of Argentina, so often this was uh, if you will, wine made for the uh, Italian emigre community, the largest outside of Italy in the world. And think of Italian wine, cheap and cheerful. I mean, up until the last 20, 30, 40 years, that's the purpose of Italian wine. And the same is true of Argentine wine. Up until the last 20, 30 years, cheap and cheerful is the purpose of wine. And, and Argentina has figured out um, the international marketplace and is, has been making wine for 20 or 30 years for the international marketplace in most cases, going away from, you know, what I would regard as, as kind of the simplistic uh, area of, of uh, more of the, the, the plains here and moving up instead into the, the uh, foothills of the Andes where you can what? You can make more differentiated wines, more, more interesting wines, more internationally styled wines, if you will. They're gonna be more expensive. So they're not cheap. And, and they may be cheerful, but they're not cheap. And, and so they're ideal for the, for the international marketplace. When it comes to Chile, so much of, of uh, viticulture uh, basically was in and around the, the, the capital city of Santiago. 85% um, of the population until recently was in and around the town, uh, the city of Santiago for safety purposes, in some cases uh, against the native peoples there. Um, and, and what we have seen is I think the last 20, 30 years, particularly the last 10 years, have seen a reconsideration of viticulture in Chile. That is to say that the traditional areas are being repurposed for um, other grapes and the non-traditional areas are being repurposed for other grapes, which is to say a, a sort of rationalization of understanding what are Cabernet's needs, what are Chardonnay's needs, what are Sauvignon Blanc's needs, what are Merlot's needs, and on and on. And, and to my palate, it, it makes things extraordinarily exciting in Chile. In, in both cases though, what it also makes us do is give new consideration to areas that were too far south, too cold, hither to four, for agriculture and for viticulture, uh, particularly for uh, viticulture for you know wine growing, but as a shift towards the international market becomes more and more important to these countries uh, viticultural fortunes, finding these cooler sites to make more differentiated wines is ideal. So with all that as, as baggage, if you will, let's just kind of think about Chile for a second. Both Chile and Argentina have vast amounts of, of irrigation available from the Andes, which is good because both of them do deal with very dry conditions, particularly when we're talking about um, Patagonia. Dry, windy, uh, cold, so having available irrigation uh, is, is a life, uh, you know, godsend. It's the lifeblood of the area as well. It does say here that there is no phylloxera. It's true. 
um, there's not much, shall we say, and it hasn't become a problem yet. Um, so mostly own rooted vineyards, which can be advantageous in some ways in terms of yields and you don't have to make choices about rootstock, which just complicates things like yields and irrigation and such. Um, whether or not that makes better wine is, is the subject for another lecture some other day, which will uh, end on a note, okay? We don't know. Great, let's just talk about the, the subregions. Primarily what we're gonna be talking about when we uh, talk about Patagonia is, is the you know, so-called Austral uh, region that you can see here. Most of what we've talked about up until now when it comes to Chilean wine is, is the Valle Central. And, you know, kind of the cool kids uh, doing a lot of stuff up here in Aconcagua and, and many uh, improvements here in the, the uh, sewer uh, area. Um, so, yeah, we're steadily marching south, if you will, trying to find better and better sites. Um, it's, it's not as though we just learned about uh, places like, uh, you know, Curaco and uh, Maule and Itata and even Bio Bio. But what I think is happening is we're getting the right grapes in the right places there. Conversely, I, I would say up here in the north, you know, we're now talking about not just Casablanca, which it was the cool kid on the block uh, 20 years ago and still is doing really cool stuff, but San Antonio and Leda, I mean, these are coastal, in many cases, extreme coastal uh, vineyard sites. And, and I bring that up to say, look, that's the, the march towards excellence that Chileans are, are involved in right now. And, and so going farther south is, uh, if you will, an ancillary or a parallel track in trying to find cooler and cooler sites to make other styles of wines, all right? And in this case, we're gonna be talking mostly about white grapes, but Pinot Noir as well. Um, grapes that don't require quite as much um, warmth, to, warmth to ripen them. Um, when we talk about Chile though, I think it's very important to understand that one of the other uh, improvements in our understanding of Chilean viticulture uh, and Chilean wine is that rather than north to south considerations, really what we're talking about these days are west to east considerations. That's to say either you're coastal or you're you know, Andes based in the Andes mountains or you're entre cordillera, you're between those, those sites. And that's often how we talk about viticulture uh, there. And I think um, more, more wisely uh, because that's really often what the, the dominant factor is in understanding what grapes should be grown there, what style they're going to be, and, and that sort of thing. Now, um, to, to look a little more closely at all this, uh, Patagonia, um, here, here is, if you will, uh, Argentina, and, and taking a look at the, the sites we're going to look at when it comes to Argentine Patagonia. We're going to be talking primarily, uh, you know, basically one uh, very successful winery in La Pampa, um, a number of wineries in uh, Rio Negro, and they've been, some of which have been there for over a hundred years. And uh, Nick Kien, uh here as well, right next door, is sharing some of the, the same characteristics of, of Rio Negro, but there's some stuff going on down here in Chubut. So yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna be looking at, at some different spots and, and kind of focusing on, on what is possible there. Um, now, uh, as well, once again, we can say there's a parallel track. Um, there's some coastal stuff happening here, but not as much. Instead, we're, we're sort of sneaking down south as we look in, uh, in Mendoza. And I mentioned in my article um, how a, a winemaker who, with whom I had a, a wonderful conversation about this was talking about Welly's days at university and uh, when he got his uh, master's degree, he had to write a master's thesis, opining what it must be like to try to grow Cabernet Sauvignon in Valladuco, in the Yuco Valley here, okay? And he you know, wrote his article and he said, here, here I am almost 20 years later, I'm growing Cabernet in, in Valladuco because that's now not theoretical, that's actual. And there are two strands to consider in this. One is certainly climate change. The other is a differing shift, in, you know, a shift in style, trying to make not these big fat plush wines that, that uh, Malbec is so famous for in Mendoza, but wines that have a bit more structure to them. So that is the other, if you will, the other uh, implication here when we discuss why people are going south and, and uh, discussing these new areas, all right? Um, so there you go, you get a little bit uh, of a, of a click, uh, you know, uh, closer view of why the uh, Bayaduco is important 
in, uh, in, in finding cooler sites. You can see we're moving up a little bit closer into uh, the, the Andes uh, foothills. And it, it's definitely going to be colder in the daytime and definitely colder at night, all right? And then uh, by Iruco, we're even finding sub areas. And I wanted to show you these maps merely because in my uh, article, I, I talk about Guatajari and uh, how the soils here are a bit different. You get more limestone, even you know, a touch of chalk, if you will, and the wines have greater nerve and it's kind of the cool kids on the block are happening in, in Guatajari. Uh, so I wanted to show you precisely where that was and, and give you a, a better sense of it. It is within this you know, larger area that you've probably heard of before, uh, like uh, called uh, Tupangato, but um, all sorts of things happening as people find these cooler sites and, and so the same impetus is, is at work. But now let's, let's move down here uh, a little bit farther south and, and really dig into these areas. And these are the maps from the, the Argentine Association, you know, Wines of Argentina itself. But I thought it was, it, 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 they, these were great. Um, you've got uh, in La Pampa, the Rio uh, Colorado, the upper valley, uh, if you will, um, where uh, Bodega del De uh, Desierto is doing great stuff. Uh, Paul Hobbs has been such a significant uh, influence on Argentine uh, viticulture. Obviously, uh, the, the greatest influence without any questions, the Catena family. But uh, uh, Hobbs uh, inspired work here has, has uh, well, well, the wines are good, right? You know, if you've had them, you know, the wines are really good. Uh, then most of what we're seeing is in the Rio Negro upper valley down here. Uh, this is where Chakra has been for a long time. And I referenced in, in, in the article that experience I had um, on my uh, uh, first visit to Argentina, sitting in a restaurant in, in, uh, um, in uh, Buenos Aires with um, my friend Andres Rosberg, who was at the time the president of the Argentine Sommelier Association. And he's like, pick a wine. I'm like, Pinot Noir, who knew? And he's like, you should have one. I'm like, cool. Yeah, I've heard good things about Chakra. I've actually had one of their wines, but I don't think I've had Pinot Noir. And I'm like, yeah, and the 55 and the 32, what does that mean? He's like, are you kidding? Are you messing with me? And I'm like, no, no. I mean, why does it say 55? He's like, because those Pinot Noir vines were planted in 55. And I'm like, what about the 32? And he's like, because they were planted in 32. So they've been here a while. And um, without question, uh, again, one of the real, um, one of the inspirational uh, folks here still hard at work here is Hans uh, Vending Diers, who's done some great stuff at Chakra, uh, Canale, and, and now, uh, you know, uh, Bodega Noemia, and other places as well. Been a, a really important factor in uh, this march towards excellence here. But right now, we're just talking about the Upper Valley Rio Negro, but we'll be talking about some, some wines in and around the, the Lime River here, uh, over here in uh, Noikien. Um, and uh, yeah, well, let's keep going. Let's just show you a couple more maps and, and, and now let's go all the way down to Chibut. And, and here you're gonna run into a bunch of names and, and some of the, the names that we talk about when we talk about Chibut um, really are, um, I, I mean, there's this riches of, of valleys, many of which aren't really important yet. Uh, they, uh, they, they have very small amounts of vines in them. And yet you have a lot of people from up North doing really interesting stuff here. Uh, and so, you know, an, an increasing uh, amount of, of really fascinating stuff. I've mentioned already, you know, in Rio Negro, uh, Canale uh, and Chakra and Noemia. Uh, there's also uh, Huijon de Abeja, uh, uh, certainly Verum, which you've probably seen Verum. It's widely distributed in North America, Anieyo, um, and, and certainly Ricitelli, uh, Ricitei as well doing good stuff, but you, you know, let's get down into um, Chibut and, and we really start to, to, to see um, a, a lot of names. I mean, certainly Atronio is probably the famous name right down here in, in Sarmiento. Um, it is backed by Alejandro uh, Bugioni and he's a billionaire. So, you know, he's, he's making it rain if you will. Um, but there's, there's also De Bernardi in this area and, and uh, you know, Cava, uh, Yahweh and uh, Nantifal also uh, doing great stuff as, as well as uh, Contra Corriente. So, so good stuff to, to, to uh, muse over here and, and to, to give consideration to. Uh, let me see if I can show you a couple more maps here and, and we can dig in a, a little farther. Uh, Noikien, I, I, I haven't talked about some of the people doing stuff 
there, uh, you know, in Lima, Lower Valley, and it, particularly around, most of them around um, uh, San Patricio del Chañar, as you can see right here. Uh, a lot of stuff going on there, and uh, it, it uh, names like, um, uh, certainly like uh, Fendel Mundo uh, come to mind, and Familia Schroeder, and Patriti, and uh, Secreto, Porigonica. Um, so names you may not know right now, but I really would recommend that, that you learn about them. And, and in the article, I'm gonna reference the Cerros uh, Colorado uh, complex. It's a complex of dams that are creating some of these conditions here um, that are creating good conditions for, for viticulture. It's all pretty new. And that's kind of the theme of, of this whole article. While stuff goes way back when, um, it's all pretty damn new. And, and to my way of looking, really exciting uh, as a result. So yeah. Here you go. You can see uh, Noiken, um, what rainfall is like. It's it's not the the dry uh, requirement of uh, necessarily of um, of uh, irrigation that you'll see in some other areas. We get a little bit, bit more rain as we go south. We're going to see more and more and and less and less of irrigation required. But it is still going to be cold and it is still going to be windy and and still can be difficult uh, difficult conditions. But because it's a little bit warmer up here in this, this more sheltered area, we're seeing things like Malbec, Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot, Pinot Noir, and, and yeah, of course, white grapes as well. Um, it, we're also seeing that there's quite a bit of, of, of growth here uh, at quite a bit of vines here. You know, we're looking at about 5,000 acres worth of vines. So not huge by Mendoza standards by any means, but interesting the, and, and, and cool stuff going on. The other thing to say about it is, is that we're uh, not as high in elevation as we are when we talk about Mendoza. That uh, too is, is fortunate, we're going south. So start to become really um, detrimental to the, the health of the vineyard to, to be high up in elevation, okay? Um, you can see here on this uh, little slide what the kind of breakdown is of the grapes and, and Malbec is huge here. That's to, uh, to a great degree what brought Argentina to the dance as it were. You know, this is why Argentina has been successful but they of course are diversifying uh, amongst their grapes, but but uh, Nick uh, Nick Kien is very much uh, reliant right now on on Malbec, and it's a slightly different style of Malbec, much like Salta is a different style of Malbec from Mendoza. Um, so I, I would just encourage people to seek this out. I think these wines have a bit more nerve to them, and they're not as plush. They're not as easy to to, to kind of you know fall in love with um, at first blush, but that's okay. You know, give me a year or two. And there's some really interesting things happening here. All right, um, we've talked about some of these elevations and, and uh, what's available here. Uh, I, I just, uh, I, I continue to, to, to believe that I need to pay attention to this area because of what's going on here. Chibut I've talked about already. Now you can see again, um, these are not high in elevation. You know, um, we are uh, up to 2000 feet in elevation and that's kind of it. And, and a lot of it is, is closer to uh, sea level. This is, uh, it says on this, this highlight, the, the southernmost vineyard in the world, which it is not anymore <laughs> because they've been bested by the Patagonians on the other side of the Andes, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, rainfall, we, we are fairly dry down here. We're getting, a, it, you know, it's getting a little better here, um, but it is certainly very windy, which creates its own uh, moisture issues. That's really good in terms of being able to be organic and not have to worry about mildew but it, it challenges you if you don't have enough rainfall during the growing season. Nonetheless, this is, um, well, frankly, um, we're right up uh, uh, against, um, in this case, the Atlantic Ocean. And it's, it's really pretty. I mean, I, I find it uh, beautiful and charming, but you're gonna see here, we're really starting to rely more and more on white grapes and the red grapes that we do have here, it's primarily Pinot Noir. We are dealing with a cooler site, bottom line, end of story. Um, the the uh, characteristics of, of the place, once again, I, I, I find it, as I said, really beautiful, but it's very small in terms of planting right now. We, you know, we're about 300 acres, I think is where we are as of today. And um, just, just got the, the new GI of Trevelin, um, at, at tiny little places with tiny little planting as, as uh, I, I can show you here, but uh, you, you get the idea, you know, very uh, constant uh, wind, certainly can be dry. And um, uh, look at some of these acreages here. Uh, in uh, Comarca Andina Paralelo, um, 
it's you know 57 acres total. Let's let's keep going and, and look at some of these other areas. Um, when it comes to uh, 16 October, the October uh, uh, Appalachia uh, you know area also now encompasses encompasses the Trevelyan GI 21 acres. All right, here we go. <laughs> Basically nothing in Paso del Sapo. Uh, very little, 100 acres or so in Sarmiento, and that's where the billionaire is. So you know that's where a lot of the action is right now, and and uh, it's 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 relatively dry, definitely windy, definitely cold, and and I, I just think that um, there's a lot of really interesting things happening because it's very new. It's it's premature for for some of this to be uh, carved into stone. Having said that, Rio Negro, as I started out by by saying, has Pinot Noir vineyards back to 1932, has, has viticulture back to the early 1900s. And, and you can see it's not such a small place at this point. We have almost 4,000 acres uh, of vines and it's an exciting area. Once again, Malbec becomes very important. Merlot does extremely well here. Pinot Noir has plenty of sites and growing importance of, of white grapes. The upper valley, as I, as I started out by explaining, is where a, a lot of these um, names that, that you may know, like Chakra and Canale and such, that's where they are, are doing their work and growing their grapes. And uh, you may have seen Wapisa around. Uh, Wapisa is the one that's been making all the, the headlines because they're doing underwater uh, aging of their bottles. And I have yet to taste one of those bottles. I keep uh, dropping the hint that, you know, you could shift a bottle up this way so we can we can make some decisions, <laughs> um, but this is uh, it, around the town of San Javier uh, is where Wapisa is and just keep going down the, the Rio Negro and you'll get to the spot in the Atlantic Ocean where those uh, bottles are being aged under the water. It's very interesting and, and um, I like the wines here very much, the, the Malbec and the Sauvignon Blanc in particular just have good nerve to them and they're very different than Mendoza. Uh, and, but, but also in my view, uh, aside from a handful of really great producers in Cajor, are uh, more generous and more structured than um, Malbec from Mendoza. And, and I don't, you know, as I say, aside from a handful of producers in Cajor, I don't really get that excited about Cajor most of the time. Um, those wines are usually more structured than they are generous. And there seems to be some generosity to all of these. Uh, heading north, uh, I began really by focusing on Bodega uh, La Desieta, uh, in La Pampa, it's basically one place. Uh, it's all red grapes um, and, and they're very successful. They're, if you've had the wines, you know where I speak. So yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, when, I, when I talk about uh, Chile, because I, I, I had to give short shrift to Chile because I didn't have a, a wealth of maps to show you here, but I would just say, let's start in the South. Um, Chile, uh, the Chile Island, part of the, the, the peninsula there, is uh, Aurelio Montes, Montes is doing some stuff down there. And we all just kind of went Burr! when, when uh, Montes uh, bought a spot down there and has started planting grapes literally inches <laughs> from, from the Pacific waters. And uh, I, I'm dying to taste what those wines are like. Needless to say, we are talking about white grapes here. Um, the, the a uh, larger area, if you will, the lake region or Los Lagos. Um, there's some there's some amazing stuff there. I've had Rieslings and Gewürztraminers and sparkling wines from from this area. Um, the the, um, the 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 wines here, I think, are. Um, I'm excited to see what happens next. And it is very much what happens next. On the other hand, I've had Riesling with some age on it from from uh, the lake region, and it's. I mean, I'm a kind of a Riesling knucklehead and I totally believe in these wines. I, I completely believe that these wines are, are worth our attention, worth our focus. Um, you know, around the, the, the town of Osorno, you will find a bunch of great stuff. And I reference it in, in, in the article, you know, Miguel Torres is down there and, and uh, certainly uh, Trapi del Bueno along the, the Bueno. Uh, river is important, and Cato uh, de Trumau, um, and, and Rivera Pelin. Uh, so, you know, there's stuff going on here. And some of it's people from the north, like Torres or Casa Silva coming down and, and doing good stuff. Um, but I really think that it, it's worth your time to pay attention to this. And before I leave the South, 
of course, Kepkin, you may have heard of. Um, it's around the, the Lake uh, General Carrera, uh, it, uh, uh, around uh, Chile uh, uh, Chico. Uh, Chile Chico, this is the farthest south. I don't know what those wines are like yet. I know that a lot of smart people are saying, oh, you need to know what these wines are like. And I'm anxious to get back down there um, once we're allowed to travel again, because it's been since December of 2019 that I was uh, in Chile and, and wanted, I wanna go drink those wines, but that's when I got to have a real dose of, of um, Riesling and Gewürz and sparkling wine from Las Lagos. Um, but if we, if we you know, move a little bit north, but still in Patagonia and we're in uh, Araucania, um, particularly around Mayeco Valley, uh, also Catin Valley, it, some stuff there, but Mayeco is, is to me kind of where I want to uh, focus your, your thoughts uh, and, and, and your, you know, maybe your dollars, maybe your palettes. Vigna Aquitania has done some super cool stuff since uh, Felipe de Sonmaniac uh, moved there in the early 90s and started uh, growing uh, grapes there and had the help and the assistance of, of Bruno Prats and Paul Pontellier, may he rest in peace. He was certainly one of the nicest people I ever got to associate with in, in Bordeaux. And, and with their help, I think really did some, some quickly did some remarkable things at Vino Aquitania. And, and there are many other people now there that, that we should give consideration to uh, in and around uh, Mayeco and, and to some degree in Cautin. Um, but, you know, they would include Baitig and uh, Claude Fou and De Martino from uh, up north and, and uh, Laurentier, uh, Selva Ascura, the sparkling wine, do check that out. Uh, first uh, chance that you get and Coqueche and uh, P.S. Garcia, which is always a really cool name to look for. They, they do a bunch of really interesting small scale wines at Tayu and Undaraga, again from up, up north and uh, Vigna Capitan and Vigna Anco and, and uh, Volcanes, Volcanes uh, de Chile. Um, and then finally, you may be have had some of the really excellent wines from William Fevre, Chile. So people from all over are figuring this out. And, and while in my article, please forgive me if I seem to be uh, tweaking the, the French a little bit for their early efforts in Chile. Um, it is just to say that I think there was a time when I was slightly critical of, of the traditional French approach to Chilean wines. And, and for, I don't know, 30 years, I, I think that was a valid criticism. But for the last 20 years, it, it is less and less so. It is, is much truer to state that the French consultants who come over now understand that they're in a different realm and a different climate and a different terroir and are, are really helping uh, the Chileans um, to make they're the, the best wines they've ever made, in my view, without any question. And, and the Chileans themselves are, are newly empowered to, to make excellent wines. For me, this was about Patagonia and what's happening in these cool climate sites in South America. And I hope I tipped you off to a few. And thanks. Talk soon. <laughs>